Northern Europe's security map has been redrawn not by speeches or summits, but by physics. The Baltic Sea, the North Sea, and the gateways to the North Atlantic have turned into compressed battle spaces where detection ranges are long, reaction times are brutally short, and the margin between deterrence and disaster can be measured in minutes. In waters saturated with sensors, the old assumption that you can see first, decide, then act is increasingly replaced by a harsher truth. You must be ready to act at the speed of the threat or you will be acted upon. That is the strategic logic behind the 3SM turfing program. On paper, it is just a new missile project. In reality, it signals a deeper shift in how Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Germany are thinking about sea denial, escalation control, and industrial autonomy at the very moment Europe is relearning what high-intensity conflict looks like. If the war in Ukraine has taught defense planners anything, it is that precision weapons and layered defenses compress time. Land warfare has become a contest of kill chains and counter-kill chains. At sea, that compression is even more unforgiving because ships cannot hide behind terrain and because the electromagnetic environment is more transparent than most people realize. So the question becomes uncomfortable but necessary. If a hostile surface group can target you before you can meaningfully threaten it, do you actually have a deterrent or do you have a fleet that exists mostly for peacetime presence? Smaller navies feel this pressure first. Nordic fleets do not have the mass of a superpower navy and they cannot simply buy more hulls to compensate. They have to buy reach, survivability, and credible first strike potential from outside an opponent's effective defensive envelope. Tirfing is being built for that problem set. Led by Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace and drawing on Norway's long experience with the naval strike missile, this is not an incremental tweak. The ambition is generational, a supersonic anti-ship missile designed to sustain high-speed, stretch engagement ranges beyond current European sea-skimming norms and complicate interception by forcing defenders into a reaction window that collapses just when they most need time to think. Speed matters at sea for the simplest reason. It weaponizes time. A subsonic missile gives a modern ship's combat system more seconds to detect, classify, assign interceptors, and attempt multiple engagement shots. A supersonic missile steals those seconds, and then steals more with the way it shapes the defender's geometry. The faster the threat, the more any error in track quality or latency becomes lethal, and if turfing achieves what its design intent implies, the real advantage is not merely that it arrives sooner, but that it arrives inside a defender's decision loop. Now add low-altitude profiles and evasive terminal maneuvers, and interception becomes less like a technical exercise and more like a gamble taken under stress, in clutter, with imperfect information. In a region where the sea lanes are tight and the sensor picture is crowded, that gamble can decide a campaign. The propulsion choice tells you how serious this is. Turfing is widely discussed as being built around a ramjet concept for sustained supersonic flight. That's not a marketing buzzword. It is a technical commitment with major implications for thermal management, guidance performance at high speed, and overall system complexity. It also signals what the missile is meant to do, not simply outrange older weapons, but penetrate modern naval air defense architectures that have been optimized over decades to stop exactly this kind of threat. If you are a Nordic planner thinking in sea denial terms, the goal is not to own the sea, it is to make the sea so dangerous for an adversary that they cannot operate close enough to apply pressure without accepting unacceptable risk. Norway's rationale is obvious when you look at a map. A long coastline, proximity to North Atlantic routes, and the strategic importance of keeping maritime traffic viable under pressure all point to the same requirement, the ability to threaten surface forces before they can project power ashore or interdict movement. In wartime, the sea is not just a highway, it is an approach vector. And once you accept that, coastal defense becomes inseparable from anti-ship strike capability. Sweden and Finland, now fully woven into NATO planning, face a different geography, but an even more constrained battle space. The Baltic is a sensor-rich arena where distance is short and escalation could be rapid. In that environment, the premium is on credible deterrence that does not require a large surface fleet to maintain. A high-end missile can substitute for hull numbers by imposing a standoff problem on the other side. Come closer, and you are within reach. Stay farther away and your ability to influence events shrinks. Germany's entry into Tirfing is where the story shifts from regional necessity to European strategy. Berlin moving beyond observer status into active partnership is not symbolic. It reflects an understanding that naval deterrence in the Baltic and North Sea will increasingly depend on weapons that can impose real costs even against sophisticated defenses. Germany is also NATO's central logistical hub in Europe and its interest is not abstract. Keeping Northern Sea approaches open for allied movement while denying the same freedom to a potential adversary is not a maritime hobby. It is a foundational requirement for reinforcement and sustainment in a crisis. 
So when Germany invests in a program like Tirfing, it is investing in the ability to shape the maritime geometry of a conflict before the first convoy even sails. There is also an industrial message embedded in this partnership, and it may be as consequential as the missile's performance. Tirfing's structure integrates Germany's defense industrial base through companies such as Deal Defense and MBDA Deutschland, which implies co-development rather than a simple buyer relationship. In today's Europe, that distinction matters. Strategic autonomy is not achieved by owning finished products. It is achieved by controlling the technologies, the production capacity, the upgrade pathways, and the decision rights that determine how a weapon evolves when the threat evolves. If you have learned anything from recent procurement shocks, it is that supply chains and intellectual property can become strategic choke points. So turfing is not only about deterring ships, it is about deterring dependence. And then there is the platform question, which is where strategy meets practicality. Germany's future frigate force is being designed around modularity and growth potential, and Tierfing's projected compatibility with standard vertical launch systems fits that philosophy. That is a quiet but important detail. Weapons that demand bespoke integration are expensive in peacetime and risky in crisis. Weapons that can slot into established launch architecture become scalable across fleets, which in turn makes deterrence more credible because it becomes more deployable. The underlying question for any navy is not can we buy this, but can we field this widely enough, reliably enough, and sustainably enough to change an adversary's calculations? Compatibility is the difference between a boutique capability and a doctrinal shift. Of course, the risk profile is real, and pretending otherwise would be irresponsible. Supersonic missiles are hard. Sustained high-speed flight creates punishing thermal loads. Seeker performance must remain accurate at velocity in sea clutter against decoys. Electronic warfare will be part of every serious naval engagement, and resilience against jamming and deception is not optional. Adversaries will not stand still. They will refine air defenses, expand interceptor inventories, improve soft kill systems, and train for exactly this threat. But acknowledging those challenges does not weaken the case for Tierfing. It strengthens it because it frames the program as a calculated response to an evolving contest rather than a technological vanity project. Deterrence is not about perfection. It is about credible probability at the moment of decision. That is also why the concept of complementarity matters. Turfing is not designed to erase subsonic systems overnight. A balanced arsenal benefits from different flight profiles and cost curves. Subsonic missiles can still be valuable for stealthy approaches, for saturation, and for creating tactical dilemmas at scale. A supersonic option adds a different kind of pressure, a high-impact tool for critical targets where time and interception probability become the decisive variables. In other words, this is less about replacing one missile with another and more about expanding the commander's toolkit so that an adversary cannot optimize their defenses around a single predictable threat. The timeline reinforces that this is not hype. Turfing is discussed in terms that extend into the early and mid 2030s, with developmental milestones centered on propulsion testing, seeker integration, and system validation. That pace may frustrate audiences hungry for immediate solutions, but it is consistent with the reality of advanced missile development. And in a region accustomed to long procurement cycles, realism can be a feature, not a flaw. The real signals to watch are not only test events, but budget allocations, integration plans, and how quickly the program connects to broader operational concepts like joint targeting, sensor fusion, and resilient command and control. A missile's theoretical range means little if it cannot be fed accurate targeting data under pressure in the hours when an opponent is actively trying to blind and confuse your network. So Tierfing ultimately asks a bigger question about Northern Europe's future posture. In a maritime arena where the first credible long-range strike can define the fight who gets to set the terms of access and who is forced to react, this program suggests the Nordics in Germany are trying to answer that question early with a weapon designed to compress an adversary's options just as the adversary tries to compress theirs. If Turfing succeeds, it will not merely add another missile to the inventory, it will change the calculus of operating in the Baltic and North Sea, pushing hostile planning farther out, raising the cost of coercion and reinforcing the idea that even smaller fleets can deny, deter and endure when they combine smart industrial choices with hard-nosed operational logic. If you want to understand where European defense is heading, watch programs like this. Not because they promise a single game-changer, but because they reveal how strategy, industry and technology are being stitched together for the next decade. And as Tierfin moves from design to testing to integration, the story will be written in the small details, procurement decisions, ship fit plans, and the quiet evolution of NATO's northern concept of operations. Stay with the analysis because the balance of power in these waters will not shift in one dramatic moment. It will shift one capability decision at a time.